because we want to make sure those who can't make it live can listen later. So this is the first time we're presenting a webinar about the program and we do hope you find it really worthwhile. Before we get into the presentation and just to allow a couple more minutes for people to join, I'm gonna give a brief introduction uh, about the London Community Foundation. And uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Al Day, who is our grants committee chair to share his welcoming remarks. So Vanessa, next slide. So you'll notice on this slide, um, LCF's mission, which uh, includes strategic investing to drive innovative community-based initiatives. So that strategic investing uh, mentioned here includes the granting and the social impact loans that we make. And those initiatives uh, include those supported through the Community Vitality Program. So just to give you a scope, an idea of the scope of our investing, in 2020, we made over 600 grants valued at $4.2 million to about 230 registered charitable organizations in the London and Middlesex region. One million of that was allocated through the Community Vitality Grant Program. On the social impact side, as of the end of 2020, we've cumulatively made almost $11.5 million worth of loans, and that's even grown since 2021. Our fiscal year ends December 31st, so those 2021 numbers are, are still being calculated and finalized. Vanessa, can we move to the next? Okay, so I'm now pleased to introduce Mr. Al Day. Al is of the Turtle Clan and his Oneida name is Loda Hawit. Currently he sits as Sunessus, one of nine traditional chiefs of the Oneida Nation Council of Chiefs. He has been married to partner Laurel for 54 years and is the father of Paul and Brian and has resided at the Oneida settlement since birth. Al retired in 2007 and he rejoined the workforce in 2008 and he is currently the executive director of Namarin Friendship Center and has been since 2011. And under his leadership, Namarin has grown substantially in staff and programming and has entered into a number of agreements, including with the City of London, the Children's Aid Society of London and Middlesex and the Thames Valley District School Board. Al has been an involved member of the Oneida community in sports and community service organizations, including over 50 years in leadership positions. He has represented Oneida and Namarind on numerous boards and agencies. Al was instrumental in the establishment of a number of regional and local organizations whose goals are to contribute to the well-being of Indigenous peoples. He has served as a policy analyst for Indigenous organizations in the U.S. and Canada and has participated in negotiations with federal, provincial, and state governments in both Canada and the U.S. With respect to London Community Foundation, Al was asked to join the Back to the River Committee in 2016. Following this, he was invited to sit on the Grants Committee and in 2019, he joined the Board of Directors. LCF is honored to continue to have Al on its board and that this year he is beginning his term as chair of the grants committee. So Al, I'll turn it over to you to officially open our webinar. Thank you, Lori. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, and I'm just gonna say a couple of words in my language. Uh, so, so what I said uh, was just to welcome everybody. I hope everybody is doing good. And I told you my name is Linda Hobbit and I'm a Turtle Clan member. Um, normally, uh, what we do, uh, what we've been doing lately is uh, as part of my contribution to both the Grants Committee and the Board of Directors is to go to, to uh, put together a, a, a opening uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, and it's not the same as what's been, you probably have heard if you've heard it, the, our, our process, traditional process in Oneida and Haudenosaunee country is to give thanks to all parts of creation. 
So I'm not going to go through that, but I've sat through openings where a, a minimum, uh, or at least it's been two times been an hour each time. So that's a long time. So obviously we're not going to do that today. So welcome again, everybody. I just want to let everybody know that uh, ideally, uh, you know, we'd, uh, we're going to get past this, this pandemic we're currently in and we're going to have more face-to-face -face meetings, but we understand that, uh, you know, the, the current situation has been a stressful time and, uh, and ideally, uh, as we go forward, maybe by the time you, you actually get to do presentations to the committee, you're going to be doing it in person. But uh, one of the challenges, of course, is putting together proposals that are, are based on, on virtual as well as written information. So I encourage you to take the time that you need to to put them together. And uh, ideally, uh, you will uh, you will get, uh, you'll, you'll be, uh, I guess, uh, being considered for a grant. One of the things I've, I've, I want to let you know that uh, I've learned since I've been part of the uh, London Community Foundation is that there are many, many exciting, innovative things that are going on in London. I'm sure each and one of you, each and every one of you have, have that same thought in mind that your proposal is going to do that. So I encourage you to, to uh, you know, again, put your best mind forward to do that. And, uh, the only thing I, I'd say is, in the end, as Laurie mentioned, uh, there are multiple grants that have been given out by the Community Foundation, and hopefully that uh, not everybody can be successful, but uh, you know, part of that whole process is going through it. And uh, again, thank you for your time and interest, and I'll turn it back to the staff, and I'll take you through the presentation. So thank you very much. Yawanko. Thank you, Al, for those very kind words. So um, we're going to move to the agenda so that you have an idea of what we're going to cover today. And uh, it's essentially we're going to review the information that's presented in the applicant guide, which, by the way, new for 2022, it's also available in French. So we're hoping that we can equip you to put your strongest proposal forward should you decide to submit. Um, so the presentation is going to take about 20 minutes and we'll leave some time for questions. And uh, as you're listening, feel free to go ahead and post your questions in the chat and we'll uh, collate them to address them at the end. And uh, we'll answer as many as we can. Okay, so first we're going to start with the program overview. Uh, Vanessa, next slide. And so once again, for 2022, the Vitality Grant Program has a million dollars total available to grant. Uh, disbursement may be requested over one, two, or three years, and we're recommending a maximum ask of $350,000. Uh, this program supports innovative projects seeking to improve the quality of life for our region citizens. So region uh, is also another word for LCF's catchment, which includes the City of London, the County of Middlesex, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie, Delaware Nation. Next slide. So proposals are especially encouraged that represent true partnerships demonstrate commitment to collaboration and leverages existing or new funding resources. We also encourage proposals that value and embody the concept, nothing about us without us. So how are the individuals representative of the populations being served and how are they involved in the decision-making and the delivery of the project? So the Vitality Program is one of the main ways that LCF actively responds to its vital signs report. And I'm going to share a little bit about that next. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are a global framework and plan to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. The SDGs are strongly aligned with LCF's vital signs issue areas. Rooted in the important philosophy of leave no one behind, the SDGs offer a shared universal language to communicate and track our impact over time. The SDGs foster collaboration as we all work toward these goals together. 
Next slide. Vital Signs is LCF's annual checkup on the state of our community and is a national program in partnership with Community Foundations of Canada. It examines issues that are significant to well being and quality of life. By creating awareness of these issues, we can connect philanthropy to the needs of the community, set priorities, and identify opportunities for action. Please consider how your proposal addresses at least one of these vital sign issue areas, education, gender equality, racial equality, food security, housing, and well-being. I encourage you to visit the bethechangelondon.ca site where you'll find for each of these issue areas corresponding data, blog posts from local leaders, and other content that will help inform your proposal. So here is the core program criteria. We invite submissions that propose an approach to tackling a community issue area in a way that one, is substantively new, two, aims for significant change to the current state of affairs, three, is innovative while still accountable and measurable, and four, improves or leverages resources and investments. So next I'm going to uh, detail these four components and then share some examples of past uh, recipients to illustrate further. So the number one uh, criteria was substantively new. So what does that mean? Maybe it's a new approach to an issue for our community that we haven't experienced here before. Or maybe it's a different way of thinking about an issue and its causes and impacts in ways we've not thought of in our community. Maybe it's about bringing together different partners in different ways that might have an impact on changing the system or creating new and impactful collaborations. You may wish to consider if it is an initiative that's in, been impactful in another jurisdiction that you'd like to see happen in our community and that it is an important innovation over an existing approach. So an example I'd like to share here is an initiative LCF supported in 2017. And by the way, you can find past recipient information on the Community Vitality uh, page on our website. There are short stories and uh, short videos that have been prepared for every recipient, so you can really get kind of a high level understanding. So the initiative I'm going to share about you with you was called Bridging Community and Campus Services to Support Students' Mental Health. And it was a unique collaboration for Canada that initially included the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, the University Students Council at Western, the Society of Graduate Students at Western, King's University College, uh, Western University, and Fanshawe College. So it was created because of the growing need of uh, mental health needs among post-secondary students, especially during exam periods, for example. Um, the CMHA was finding that students were showing up at their crisis center and uh, there, there weren't enough options um, on campus and there was sort of a disconnect that could happen uh, between the support they received at the crisis center and then on campus. So the collaborations has since evolved and the initiative has been adapted during the pandemic and it continues to be a vital support a part of supporting student mental health, ensuring that that, that, that falling through the cracks doesn't happen. Uh, so th there's a great example of a really neat collaboration. And I know that they've been able to share that model um, with other campuses. So the second element is about significantly changing the state affairs in our community. So again, what does that mean? So for the grants committee, they have a few things they're looking for. One of those is, does it take an undesirable trend and turn this trend around? So in the example I just gave, um, that, that negative trend of um, mental health stresses on youth. 
So is the proposal that you're bringing forward to the foundation like, likely to turn a curve around? Or does it substantively improve results of current methods we're using while powerfully magnifying those impacts? Maybe it fills an unaddressed gap in our community that hasn't been addressed previously, but is an important piece in the whole system that's just been overlooked until now. Or maybe it alters the current system. It makes the system itself more efficient or improves things in that way. So the foundation really wants to fund proposals that, that make an impact in our community. So an example of this uh, criteria was a program called Extreme Clean that we funded in the early years of the Vitality program. This VHA home health care program has professionals and volunteers come alongside those who have just become overwhelmed um, due to life circumstances and now they're living in squalor and they're at risk of losing their home. So this was a social services gap in our community at that time that has had been effectively delivered in other jurisdictions and identified as likely to be effective here, which it certainly has been and it continues uh, to operate here in, in the community. The third element that the committee looks at is the kind of tricky balance between accountability and innovation. We know that to fund innovative projects, we have to take a few more risks. That means we're not going to have all of the answers laid out for us in advance, but the committee has to balance that with um, being st good stewards of the, the funds uh, that have been donated to the foundation and be responsible in terms of, is it a smart risk or maybe a not so smart risk? So smart risk might be around, is there a theory of change that makes the proposal plausible? Does it point to other jurisdictions or research that suggests that these approaches are effective? Um, is the committee able to understand how um, the proposal can be held accountable in terms of uh, what are the possible outcomes from it long-term? And maybe more equally important, since we're never entirely sure that we're going to get all of the outcomes that are hoped for, that's the nature of, of innovation and risk. Can we understand how to hold the proposal accountable during along the way? What are some milestones or process indicators? When should we see some results? Those things are really helpful to the committee understanding, balancing this desire for risk and innovation tempered by accountability. And finally, you can help by demonstrating your capacity to actually achieve the idea. It's one thing um, to have a fabulous idea, but sometimes around the committee table, there's questions around, is this the right collection of resources, people, expertise, knowledge, experience that can actually make this happen? What can, think about what you can do to help them understand that. Uh, if you come with a partnership, Think about the key elements such as resources, expertise that would make uh, the proposal um, more plausible and, and uh, demonstrate a likelihood that it is doable. And if you have a collaboration, demonstrate that it's real. So it needs to go beyond um, signatures on a page, really that the people who have signed on to the project have a good understanding of it, and they're excited about trying to help um, you to do it. That's very important. So in the end, we're looking at you to help LCF understand the proposal's capacity, the competence of the people putting the idea forward, and the commitment to making the change happen. Those are proposals that really intrigue the committee. So an example of a past recipient that strongly illustrates this particular criteria is an initiative funded in 2018 and it's called the London Community Dental Alliance Low Cost Dental Clinic. Clinics like this had been established in other jurisdictions 
um, but our community didn't have one. We did have some dental programs, but not a, a clinic like this. So the Alliance members that came together were those who, involved, who were involved in and had understanding of the local leaders, uh, local landscape for dental services and the great need for affordable and accessible dental care. When they brought their proposal forward. They had projections around the number of patients that could be treated once it was up and running. And what that might mean, for example, in diverting people from the ER or the difference it could make in restoring their health and confidence in themselves to pursue employment opportunities. Okay, so the fourth and final criteria element in the committee's deliberations is around whether or not the proposal has a great chance in improving or leveraging resources. LCF is interested in making its contributions magnify opportunities in the community. We're really excited if you can demonstrate that our funding helps access other funding from other foundations, maybe from private enterprise, or maybe just from the collaboration of other organizations and the folks that come together that can bring some in-kind resources to the table. Uh, but please keep in mind, when you come forward uh, with your proposal, to not have an expectation that the foundation will fund it 100% because it, that's an unlikely scenario. So collaborations can help with leveraging, attracting new contributions and demonstrating that it's not just that, oh, I think so-and-so may be interested in this or we will apply to another grant foundation, but bring some tangible evidence that you are in active dialogue with those people or, or things moving forward. That's what will really grab the committee's attention. Above all, LCF just wants to see proposals that are going to magnify or leverage its resources. So one example, and we have many, um, because again, this is, a, this is a significant requirement of, of Vitality grantees. In 2019, we were excited to fund an indwell initiative called Hope and Homes, Creating Affordable Housing in London. And that was all about es establishing another regional office so that they could expand their affordable housing in the area. And then a, a component of their pro proposal involved research and Indwell was able to leverage LCF's grant to secure a significant grant um, towards the research component, which actually allowed them to really expand the scope of the planned research and therefore the impact. So that was, that was tremendous. All right, so that concludes the criteria. We're gonna move on to the eligibility, which is going to go a little quicker. Um, so some key pointers about who can apply. So first of all, while our name is the London Community Foundation, as mentioned previously, our catchment includes not only the City of London, but the County of Middlesex, Oneida Nation of the Thames, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, and Muncie, Delaware Nation. So proposals may benefit areas outside this catchment, but it must primarily benefit uh, this area and the vitality grant dollars must be expended in this area. And although there may be two or more applicants applying together for support of a proposal, there must be a qualified donee applicant. So a qualified donee is defined by Canada Revenue Agency. The most common type is a registered charity. So that QD must have registered status with the CRA at the time that you submit an application and maintain this status through the, through the process. And uh, they're uh, one of the key applicants that are accountable for the planning and implementation of the proposal. And they may be doing this alongside one or more co-applicants. Okay. 
So again, LCF encourages proponents to identify partnerships um, that are complementary and, and true. Be sure that each understands their commitment, what it entails and how it will occur. As explained here, you may have established a connection to an organization willing to take on that leadership and accountability for the entire initiative. This is considered a co-applicant and it certainly does de demonstrate a deep level of collaboration. Partners are defined as those who are contributing toward a specific aspect or aspects of the project. And finally, um, ineligible applicants include LCF employees and immediate family and proposals for funding of an initiative that's received a grant in the past are ineligible. So just to reword that, past recipient organizations can reapply, but they just can't apply for the same initiative that was funded. All right, so last but not least, I'll review some of the application logistics. So LCF uses the SurveyMonkey Apply online system to receive proposals for the Vitality Grant Program. You'll see, uh, you'll find the link to that portal on uh, the Community Vitality page. And I just wanna draw your attention that um, for technical assistance with that, if you require an alternative format to submit and for any other inquiries, please contact Linda Turner. Um, her contact information is there and we'll also provide that in a follow-up email after this webinar. Okay, so I'm just going to review kind of the overall, how the cycle unfolds. So there are three review stages and this, is, this outlines how your submission may progress. Uh, for those who have applied in the past, please note that changes have been made for 2022. Um, we're really hoping that it's going to streamline um, the experience for proponents. So the first stage, which is really the one that you want to focus on um, right now, requires you to submit a letter of intent. And it's due February 17th at 2 p.m. Um, using the online system. The Grants Committee reviews those letters, and by mid-March, they'll invite a selection of the proponents to the second stage, which involves completing an in-depth application, and that's due May 3rd. And then those will be reviewed by the committee and a selection of proponents will be invited to present their project in an interview with the committee. And those will take place in early June. And at the conclusion of the interviews, the committee will deliberate and select those to re recommend for funding to the LCF board. And so once all is approved and a grant agreement is in place, funding will be released in the fall. All right, so I'm just going to um, detail a little bit more about that first stage, that letter of intent. So again, you may request a grant up to 350,000 and that may be composed of 50%, up to 50% for capital expenses, which are costs directly related to the proposals program or objective. So I just wanna explain or give you an example of a past recipient. So the Boys and Girls Club um, had an initiative that was all about um, uh, so serving youth uh, more, and they wanted to provide more programming opportunities, and uh, they required music instruments and some recording studio equipment, so that was allowed because it was part of the bigger effort um, of providing youth with skill building opportunities. So when it comes to you're ready to, to enter your, your application onto the portal, you'll notice that there are two tasks for you to complete. So first is the organizational profile. So just tell us about, about you and then the actual letter of intent. And you can find the questions for both of um, these tasks 
uh, at the end of the applicant guide. So if you want to do some planning ahead, you can do that. But the portal certainly allows you to save and continue later. So you can do that as many times as you wish. And just note that um, the letter of intent does require to be on letterhead and have leadership signatures. And just a few more points about the letter of intent um, on the next slide. So it can only be two uh, pages in length and it needs to describe uh, what the project is about and what issues it addresses. It needs to list the benefits of completing the project, describe how the project will be carried out, who else will be involved and what are their roles. So include the community members you serve and how your project has nothing about us without us in its concept. Describe why the proponents have the capacity to undertake this proposal and achieve the outcomes identified. And finally, describe at a high level the project's budget, its funding needs, um, if you have some funders secured or being approached, and uh, it's really helpful to indicate which expenses, again, high level, that you anticipate LCF's um, contribution uh, will cover. Okay, so that concludes the presentation. So we're going to move to questions for the remainder of the time. And I've seen some popping up in the chat box here and you're welcome to continue to do that or you may raise your hand um, to share your question. Um, also, if you just prefer to follow up later with us, uh, you can email your question um, to Linda at the uh, email address grants at lcf.on.ca. And I think um, Al, if Al is still on the line, he may uh, wish to jump in on any question responses with me. That would be great. Yep. All right. Okay, so uh, Linda, I'll just look to you to maybe uh, prompt me with some questions that I will do my best to answer. I don't really see a lot of questions up here yet, Lori. Um, and I, I'm not sure how I see if somebody's hand is coming up because it's such a big screen, but um, somebody wanted to know, do, do we require all of the program criteria to be addressed in the two page letter or is that in the in-depth? Uh, application if folks are invited to it? Yes, that's a great question. And I thought about that too when I was um, preparing the presentation. With that uh, letter of intent, um, there's limited space, for, first of all, for you to explain uh, your plans. But then we also appreciate that it's also an, an could be an early stage of developing your proposal. So you're not necessarily going to have all the answers to the questions that we're looking for. So um, addressing them, addressing those points is important, but know that there's an understanding that things are in development. And, and that also uh, is the reason why um, we kind of have the timeline that we do that because it allows for you to further develop your proposal should it be moving through to the next stage. And then there was also more clarification on the, the need for a registered charitable organization to be involved in the request. Okay, yes, again, another great question. And um, just as a, a comment and in general, uh, we appreciate uh, the chair, the funding funder sector is appreciating more and more the challenge that that can present um, for nonprofits, uh, that qualified donee requirement. And so know that that is something that is, is under consideration and there's absolutely work being done um, at the government level to look at that. Uh, but for now, this is what, where we're at. So there can be absolutely other applicants or partners that don't have that qualified donee status. And I encourage you to look at the actual definition on the Canada Revenue Agency, because it isn't 
although charities is the most common, there are other types uh, of qualified donees. And so that may give you um, some other ideas around that. Um, but the, so the key thing is, is that the found, our foundation can only issue grants to a qualified donee. So this is the, this is the challenge. Um, so I, it, it, the door is open. You're welcome to uh, follow up with, with Linda uh, if you wish to uh, discuss this further. Yeah, and we just got another question from Sarah about um, determining the amounts for these grants. And uh, do we discuss whether we think they're high or low with the applicants? Mm, okay, so yes, for sure. So I, I should note that um, the foundation does reserve the right to partially fund proposals, but we would do that in a conversation. Uh, with the proponents. So we absolutely respect that the proponents have pulled together a budget considering like what is it going to take to do this in a way that's actually going to have the hoped for impact. Um, but then we do have this challenge of limited dollars and often some really great ideas and we want to fund to the best ability possible. So that is what our aim is. And um, yes, be assured that that conversation about the request and the amount and understanding the budget would take place. And salaries from Carla wants to know about salary inclusion in the applications. Hmm. Yeah, so th this is one of the things I'm, um, I'm really grateful for about the program because uh, we don't have many restrictions around what expenses can be covered by a, a Vitality grant. And uh, you'll notice in the applicant guide, we do talk about salaries. So the intention around that is yes, we will fund salaries. It needs to be clearly linked to the proposal. So um, when we don't, this program is not um, for operating dollars for what is already happening within an agency. It needs to be specifically um, for the project. And I think too, Lori, I'm, I'm, maybe we, we're not being clear enough about requiring co-applicants or requiring partners. A requirement is mm. it? So collaboration is a requirement. Um, so at minimum, partners need to be involved in the proposal. Co-applicants are not a requirement. Um, but as I mentioned, if there is a co-applicant, it is a it is um, considered a very strong a stronger uh, level of collaboration. I don't see any hands up or any more questions at this time. Thank you, Linda. Lori, if I could just add. Uh, Let's do. I, 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 for everybody that's thinking about applying, I, you know, my experience on the, on the grants committee is that in the end, you have to need, you need to understand and know what your proposal is all about. You have to understand it because the, the various grant committee members come from a variety of backgrounds and uh, they're going to look at the, your proposal. And ultimately, if you reach that stage of asking, uh, being asked questions, they're going to ask those questions from their area of expertise. So again, it comes down to is uh, how well you know the proposal and how prepared you are to think on your feet if required. So it's not to scare you off. It just need you just need to know that you need to put some time and effort into into thinking about what you're you're planning to do. We do have another couple of questions. Uh, Kevin Daly has his hand up, and uh, maybe we could go to Kevin. If you could unmute, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, I, I'm with a with a charity, and we're an ongoing operation. And anything that we would apply for 
could be wages and everything, but it's like our ongoing operation. And Lori just said that it's not for ongoing op operations. It's, it's for something that's new. So would it be worth our while to apply for this? Say, and, that, and that's what we need. We need the money on an ongoing operation type thing. It's, it's, it's um, something we just opened up a woman's house and stuff like that, but it's not a new situation that 